Well, I want to talk about, well, did, did, did England turn their back on Israel? And this is a big deal, okay? This is a big deal. If as nations, we have to, we have as a nation, right? We, we have to, um, mom, you might have to follow me with a camera. Or if I want one of my cameramen, you want to try? You want, let, 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 let Tristan try. I think Tristan can do it. He's my, he's my cameraman. We, we were actually talking about that in class space. Just follow, you might have to follow me just a little bit. I'm going to loosen it up for you. There you go. I should have thought about that ahead of time. Just keep, keep it on me. And then all you got to do is pan left or right. It's called a pan. Uh, so we have to, we have, we have to really understand that, you know, what happens to nations when they turn their back on Israel. And I want to start with England. They, I like England. I love, I love it. I love it. I love, I love a lot of things about England. I, I did my family research not too long ago. And of course, me being, uh, coming from a German family, they, I get harp, we get, we, they, they, we harp on this Germanness, right? Or, our German greatness and none of the bad stuff of German greatness, but sometimes you think that. But then I found out, you know what? We're actually 70 percent German. I mean, 70 percent English. I'm sorry. I found out I'm more English than anything else. So it's actually a big part of my history. Uh, but I want to start with and I don't have time to go over the whole history, but I want to start with actually this guy right here. So this is King Edward the first. OK. Now, how many how many of us have seen Braveheart here? We talked about Braveheart this morning. It's okay. Raise your hand. We know we know we know we've seen Braveheart. Everybody's probably seen Braveheart. This is the king. This is King Longshanks. Okay. They didn't call they didn't call him Longshanks because he had long shanks. They called him long shanks because he had long shins. He was six feet two, which was really big back then, was really tall back then. So just so you know, actually Braveheart, William Wallace actually was, the real William Wallace actually was close to seven feet tall. He was actually six foot seven. Which is that was really big back then. So, uh, of course, Mel Gibson was the only thing. He's about my my height, about five nine, five eight. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about the heights. So I'm about to talk some serious stuff here about what they did to the Jews. Uh, and I'm I'm actually it's I'm ashamed to say that I come from English descent because Edward the first was the first person, or first country, first king to actually issue a edit expulsion of the Jews. Actually, the first country to legally decree the Jews out of the country, you know, as, as, as country, you know, as, as, as a world, we often we often stereotype Jewish people. We say, well, Jewish people are are uh, money hungry. Every every nation has money hungry people. But, you know, it was actually the English who forced them into money lending roles. So Christians were weren't allowed to uh, lend money. So King Edward forced the Jews to actually be money lenders. A lot of people didn't know that. And so they, what it did was it actually made the Jewish people wealthy, but also highly unpopular. So wars cost money. So what had happened when the Jewish people uh, or whenever King Edward's wars weren't going too well, they would take it out and they'd blame the Jewish people. So the Jewish people in England have had a very rough history. And if we look at this, and I don't know if you all see some of this back there, we can see where the Jewish people have been. They've been exposed or they've been attacked throughout all of Europe. Uh, if you look in the middle of Germany, look how many times Germany. This is not counting, uh, you know, the, the 19th century World War II. So 1348 was a big year. 1348 was when we had the Black Plague. Uh, and a matter of fact, the Jewish people got blamed for the Black Plague. And it wasn't their, wasn't their fault at all. It wasn't really anybody's fault except for the medicine and uh, hygiene was just was not where it was supposed to be. So we can see the Jewish people were, were scattered across everywhere. And I, I want to now listen to me, church. I want you all to pay attention to me because I want to I want to land the plane somewhere real quick. I want you all to listen to this. One of the biggest perpetrators behind all this was indeed the Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church was behind a lot, a lot of this. But I don't want to tell you that they're the enemy because they're not. They're not the enemy. All right. And I say that because we talk about it, it, I think it's God's sin. It's, it's, it's uncanny, but it's God's sin that we're talking about Mike and Cindy today. Mike and Cindy were, were members of Catholic, of a Catholic church. And if it wasn't for the love of Bethel Baptist Church, they would have gone to another church, okay? So remember that. The Catholics are not our enemies. They might, you know, they might have been behind a lot, a lot of the, the major wars and a lot of what happened, but they're not our enemies. So back to England. So England, I'm going to skip, skip, skip to go over here. So England at one time, they had all this land. And if y'all, if y'all are colorblind like me, you probably can't see the red, but if you look at it, this is, this is probably like the year 1914. 
They had all of Canada. They had all of Africa, parts of Africa. Look at all that cheddar right there. You have to follow me, young man, over here. So we have uh, Australia, southern. Remember, they had southern. They had southern Africa too. They had all all the uh, Arabic countries, India. Now, this is what England is today, minus the Falkland Islands. It's a little bit few tiny islands in their their country as a whole. So England turned their back on Israel. So during World War I, the British Navy, their, the guns were running short of gunpowder. And Sir Winston Churchill was actually the Lord of Admiralty then. And he contacted this Jewish chemist named uh, Ch uh, uh, Cham Wiseman. And Cham Wiseman actually produced the gunpowder they needed. 30,000 pounds, that's a lot. 30 pounds of synthetic acetone is what they needed. And that's a lot. Of, that's a lot. And uh, he was considered a national hero. But while all this is going on was the Bellflower Declaration. Okay, the Bellflower Declaration was British promise to Israel, to the Jewish people. For, because remember, Israel was not a nation yet, right? That was their promise. And this is where, and this is where, this is key. This is where England turned their back on Israel. Okay, they did not follow through with their promise. But guess who follows through with their promises? God does. God promised they would be a nation, and God came through with that. And next week, I want to I want to actually touch on this. This 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 is where I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna actually let me talk about let me talk about this part real quick. So, all right. So when England did not follow through on the Belfast promise, a lot of Jewish people they would end up suffering because they were still stuck in Germany. And uh, the Germans, of all people, believe it or not, actually had an agreement to send them to Palestine. Uh, but the British Navy was blocking the immigrants from actually going into uh, Palestine. Not saying the Germans were the good guys. They weren't because a lot of Jews, millions of Jews suffered in Germany. But when Israel became a nation in 1930, uh, 1948, Great Britain has ignored their promise. They opposed the Jewish state. They, bear, they backed the Arabs, Arabs over oil. It was all over oil. But this is what I'm. This is what this is what this is going to. I'm going to play to y'all's political politics here. I want to show y'all something really cool. We're going to talk about this next week. These are two men entirely different from each other. Similarities they have were that they both loved Israel, and they both were probably not the most popular presidents. But they got one Democrat and you got one Republican. And I want you all next week, we're going to look at both these men's life. And I want you all to I want you all to lay aside party affiliations. And look at what these men did for Israel. And that's it on that. That's that's this my my short history. Hope that was hope that was informative. But next week, we're going to talk about Harry Truman and, and uh, as they call him, Tricky Dick <laughs> Nixon. All right. Thank you, young man. You can probably take a seat as long as you got, as long as you got it on me. Or th thank you, uh, thank you. That's Tristan. Yeah, thank you, Tristan. I say that's my my oldest. I wanted to name I wanted to name my oldest uh, my oldest uh, Tristan. His his middle name's Tristan, and uh, of course he's like, Daddy, that's so weird. So I wanted to name him after the character from Legends of the Falls. They said it's a, they, someone told me it's a chick flick. Whatever, kind of is a chick flick to be honest with you. But the character in it is a strong character, so. Um, all right, so enough about that, Brandon. Let's get to the Word of God. Who's ready for some good preaching this morning? <laughs> me too, me too. Y'all, guys and gals, y'all let me know if y'all hear about it, because I'm always looking for some good preaching. Uh, just so y'all know, I, I, I want y'all to always remember our pastor emeritus, okay? Charles Fake. If you're looking for some good preaching, go to his blog. It's, it's Charles Fake, F-A-K-E, just like he spelled fake. It's called It's On My Mind, and there's some good preaching on there. He doesn't write blogs anymore, but he's got, I think, like over 5,000 blogs on there you can look at. Uh, but Charles, if you're out there listening, Charles, we love you. Uh, you'll always be Bethel's pastor, and you will always be my friend. And we miss you, and we love you. So let's get to the Word of God. Before we get to that real quick, you know, all religious books, they claim to be the Word of God. But prophecy sets the Bible apart as having God's seal of authentication on it. Um. After Jesus' triumph, triumphant entry, he looked over Jerusalem and wept. Luke 19 states, there we go. And when we, he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day 
the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you. And him will come, them will come from the other side, every side. And you tear down the ground to the ground. And you tear down to the ground, sorry. And you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you. Not one stone. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus also added in Matthew. He also added this in Matthew. He said, so when, the, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken about by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you guided me in preparation. I thank you for all the uh, sermon prep you've given me. I thank you for all the mentors you've given me. Most of all, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I pray that the Holy Spirit just guides me today, Lord, and just, just uh, your truths come out. In Jesus' name, amen. This was a day that, that God's people should recognize. Not only did they fail to recognize it, but the leaders, they did everything in their power to stop this from, uh, to try to prevent this day from happening. Jesus foretold of destruction several times on several occasions. In Luke 21, the disciples were talking about how, uh, about how marvelous and beautiful the temple was. We're talking about the temple, by the way. The temple was a pride and glory of Israel. Jesus said that not one stone would be left on the temple. Because of these prophecies, the early Christians, they recognized the coming destruction and were able to escape. Jesus' prophecy refers back to the prophecy which says the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The prince in the text is not referring to, uh, to the Messiah, to Jesus, but the head of a revived Roman empire, identified by some as the Antichrist. Jesus added to it by saying that, not one stone of the temple will be left on top of the other. The temple, church, and sanctuary are the same. When Rome came to destroy Jerusalem, they fulfilled the destruction of the sanctuary. But the prince did not exalt himself as God, and the prince did not defile the temple. Under the uh, uh, Emperor Nero, if we remember, Nero was one of the biggest persecutors, or probably the biggest persecutor of Christians. Uh, the Jews revolted against uh, Rome. Now, insurrectionists, there's a funny word today, insurrectionists. Uh, it's not funny about people dying, but it's a funny word to me today because we, we get the word insurrection wrong. Technically, January 6th, I'm not up here promising, I'm not making a political sermon, but I have to state this because our society has an idea of, of, of this as an insurrection. By definition, it, it kind of falls under, under one. But we're talking about a biblical insurrection, a real insurrection. We're talking about, we're talking about, loss of life okay we're talking about loss of life we're talking about actual rebellion real rebellion okay for what it's worth uh, i mean th these were real insurrections when jesus arrived on the scene those who acknowledged him as a messiah were looking for him to free free israel from rome remember they're looking for they're looking for a king david right <laughs> they're looking for dean david to come in and kick some butt and take some names but jesus jesus wasn't that was he no, he came in riding on a, riding on a donkey. He came in, he came in, he came in to, 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 to bring love, to bring peace. He came in and he wasn't King David. He wasn't the man they were expecting. And so what happened was, since he wasn't the military leader, they're looking for a military leader, he didn't meet their expectations. You know, a lot of times we, 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 we place these expectations on, 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 on people. We, we, place, we place expectations on people, and, and people never meet expectations. You know, we, we place these expectations. Then we place these expectations on Jesus, what we think of our God. Y'all, don't put your God in a box. How many times have you done it? My God can do this. My God can do this. My God can't do that. My God can't do this. Or my God should do this. My God should say this. My God should be here doing this for me. We put our God in a box and, and, and we miss out on what God would have us understand today. And that's what the people did. And it's sad. And so, you know, the people rejected Jesus completely. 
If we look back to the trial of Jesus, Pilate gave the people a choice. You know, if you all remember this, to free Jesus or Barnabas. Barnabas was an insurrectionist, a real insurrectionist who murdered others to promote his cause. The Jews chose the murderer over Jesus. Under the burden of insanity of Nero, the Jews launched an outright rebellion in uh, 66 AD. Now remember the Maccabees. Now, I'm not encouraging you all to read Apocalypse, but it is interesting to read what what uh, uh, they came up with the Maccabees. And that's actually where I, I believe the Catholic Church actually developed the false um, the false doctrine of uh, what's it called? Um, gosh, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Purgatory. But Ma- Maccabees was a real rebellion, by the way. And so the Maccabees, they rebelled. There were, there were some leaders of this. We have a, a Simon the Star uh, as, as one of the leaders, Judas Maccabee. And so several cities around Jerusalem were destroyed as a show of force. The rebellion continued to Vespian, began its march in to destroy Jerusalem. Now Vespian uh, unexpectedly turned away from Jerusalem, and all the Christians fled Jerusalem. A short time later, Vespian's son Titus returned with, uh, with the Roman armies to lay siege around Jerusalem. Even while Titus, now get this, even while Titus was marching to Jerusalem, his father Vespian, that's his father, was proclaimed emperor of Rome, thus making Titus a prince. Prince of Rome. Daniel's prophecy stated that the people of the prince to come would surround Jerusalem. Once again, we see the amazing accuracy of scripture here. Let's talk about prophecy again real quick. All right. I want to be clear on prophecy. And, and, I, and I know that sometimes it seems like I'm hard on certain individuals because I know certain individuals, they love to follow, 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 follow prophecy. I'm not a big person on, on, on modern day prophecy. I'm not. I just don't. It just doesn't sit well with me. I am a big advocate on what biblical prophecy says. OK, because whenever God says he's going to do something. He does it and he does it to the T. There are no mistakes. There are no. Well, well, he said he was going to go this way, but he went that way. No, no. If he says it's going to happen a certain way, it's going to happen exactly that way. And, and that's what exactly what happened. The accuracy of Scripture is right there. Only God could have foretold, for, for, could have foreknown that the coming general would become a prince before he came to Jerusalem. And while Jerusalem was a compass around us, uh, was a compass around outside, they warred among themselves inside. They had two crime crime lords. Uh, while Joseph, uh, jo, uh, Josephus called 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 the uh, seditious, they were uh, you know kind of jockeying for control of the city. These were evil men, by the way, evil men inside the city, uh, you know, the Jews, who looked at chaos as an opportunity to rise to power. And uh, I want to touch on that real quick, and it's something that God just kind of laid on my heart right now, too, as well, is that we have to be careful, too, during chaos, y'all, even in our own times, okay? So here they are, here they are, here, here inside, inside Jerusalem, okay? They're being surrounded. Remember, they're, they're being surrounded by armies. We can think about what's happening like that could happen to like our own cities, all the chaos that would break out, all, all, all the insanity. Evil men love to take opportunity of these chaos. That's how Hitler came to power. They had, you know, Hitler wouldn't have come to power if things weren't so bad. Things got so crazy and so bad that people started buying, buying the Kool-Aid. They started drinking the Kool-Aid, for lack of a better word. And that's what happens these days when we when we have we have someone that we that we want to we vote for. Or we want them. We want an office. They don't win. Then the insanity starts happening. There's already insanity around in, in the first place. Then we start wanting to hear certain things because we'll do anything to get us away from where we are at now. And that's what these people did. They started thinking, OK, well, it, it sounds crazy, but he's prominent and promising us to get us out of here. He's prominent, promising us. To, 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 for a better life, promise for escape, promise for, 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 for a chance to live a normal life again. But evil men will say anything to get people to follow them. And their goal is only, self, is only self-serving. So we have to re- really remember that, that you know, times are going to get crazy. You know, right now, we, I know it seems crazy, but, you know, I, I, I've said this before. I don't think it's near as bad. You know, when we start losing, when we start losing electricity, (laughs) 
When we start seeing people dying around us, getting killed in the streets, when we start seeing people getting martyred, people getting getting kidnapped around us, you know, we just say, oh, it's happening. It's happening in other places. It's not happening here yet. But when we start seeing those things, and I, and I, then I think we, 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 can, we can be a little bit more, um, I think, proactive in our paranoia. But right now, God is really good. I'm just going to say that. God is really good. And we have we have we have actually the responsibility to acknowledge that God has done a lot for us and still doing a lot for us. We're still in the greatest country in the world. Hands down, this is the greatest country in the world. But we have a responsibility as as Christians in the greatest country in the world by God. With all the with all the pleasantries and all the privileges that we have. We need to take responsibility and use them to help others. We don't need to be at a point where we're sitting here and saying, oh, we're being persecuted. Oh, we're having so much bad. No, 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 we're not. Not yet. We will be. There will become a time. And I'm not saying that anybody doesn't have bad. We do have people that suffer. You know, we have we have people that are that we have people that have cancer. We have people that are that are sick. But that's that's separate from from. From how 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 the government is affecting us, the government's trying to. The government tries to come down, but the government has not has not succeeded. The day that somebody comes in here, the day that comes somebody comes, no one's coming here. No law enforcement hasn't come in here and tried to arrest me for preaching a sermon yet. Thank God. I think we're getting close to that point, but that hasn't happened. They've tried to what censor me on Facebook a couple of times for. <laughs> That's alarming. Don't get me wrong. It's it's alarming. But there's no reason for panic, y'all. I don't think there really is any reason for panic. When we look at the scripture and what God has us to understand today, we have all the reason but to celebrate and be calm and to appreciate. So back to the attack during uh, during 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 one attack on the wall, the Jews they made an unexpected retreat. So we're back to Jerusalem. Against the orders of Titus, many Roman soldiers, they scaled, they scaled the walls against Titus' orders uh, to pursue the Jewish soldiers, only to find that it was a trap. The Jews had covered the wooden platforms with straw and set fire to the retreat, and hundreds of, of Roman soldiers were trapped in the burning walls, and they died. This event, along with the taunting of the Jews, and years of waiting created hatred for the Jews among the Roman soldiers. So this created this 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 single event. It created a lot of hatred. Titus gave another offer for surrender, but the Jews refused. Now I don't know if I don't know if it's right for me, but I kind of I kind of respect I kind of respect those those Jewish commanders. I mean, as bad as they were, I mean, I, you know, but but just just their 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 resolve was strong. These are strong. These are strong people here. So the inhabitants were starving and dying so fast that the bodies could not be buried, but the seditious, they refused to surrender. Finally, Titus ordered an assault on the final wall of the city. The Romans broke through and began the Jewish massacre. Titus gave orders not to harm the sanctuary. You have to know this. Titus was trying everything he can not to have that sanctuary saw. But remember what Jesus said. Not one stone on top of the other will be left. Not one stone will be left. The soldiers, were, the soldiers were so caught up into such a battle frenzy, so the orders were no longer to be heard. Josephus described the out-of-control soldiers' men as a divine fury. One soldier stood on top of the other to set fire on top of the wooden structure of the golden window of the temple. The fire quickly spread to the upper rooms and began to rage, uh, began a rage inferno. The Jews... Left, uh, left, uh, left off fighting because the temple was their, their highest priority. So they stopped fighting. Uh, sorry to say the temple. Titus ordered the men back and he cried. Titus actually cried as the temple burned. The heat of the fire had melted the gold that decorated the temple and it seeped in the walls. Once the fire burned out, Titus ordered the rocks pried apart so the gold could be recovered. Titus church, now get this. Titus did everything he could to prevent the destruction of Jerusalem, but failed. He tried to protect the temple, but also failed. The destruction of Jerusalem was fulfilled exactly, exactly as the prophecies in Daniel and Jesus foretold. The judgment was severe and was the direct result of the rejection of peace. 
Some believe that God blinded the Jews so that they, they would reject Jesus as the Messiah and fulfill prophecy. I disagree with that. That's not true. I don't think it is. I don't think God would do that. God foretells that what will happen because he sees the end from the beginning. Well, what will happen is not necessarily what, what God intended for his people, though. OK, so you have to understand what happens. Is I don't think necessarily what God intended. For example, the Bible says that the plan of redemption through Christ was established before the foundation of the world. Not only did God know that Adam would sin and sin would separate man from God, but God had already had a plan to reconcile him, reconcile us to himself before Adam even had the opportunity to sin. Adam had everything that a man could possibly want. Yet he chose temptation over paradise. Now, I don't want to sound like a harp on Adam because I wasn't in Adam's shoes. I mean, <laughs> that's I don't know if I was in Adam's shoes. Maybe I, I probably would. have done. But I think we all would. I think we all would have made the same mistakes. We would have all done the same, the same, the same sin. But God did not make the Pharisees plot against Jesus. OK. He did not make the Pharisees plot against Jesus. He did not cause them to conspire. He did not make them love the power they held over the people. He did not make them love their wealth gained through the business of running the temple. He did not make them love the things over their love for God. They loved themselves and they loved their own ways and they hated what God revealed about himself. They first rejected truth and then they fought to establish a lie, a lie that would fit their desires. The Jews were not blinded, so they so they would reject Jesus. I don't think that. No, the Jews were blinded because they refused to accept the truth. And their Messiah, Second Thessalonians states, uh, 10 states, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. And they and, and that they shall this is Thessalonians still that they sh- should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. We see this passage again because it applies to the acceptance of the beast in Revelation. We'll see that in Revelation. So when they accept the beast, the mark of the beast, it also replies here. The principle of the same. God is merciful, y'all. God is merciful. OK, only after truth is rejected, only after he's rejected, does God allow men and women to be blinded by a lie. Now, now get this. And I've said this before. But remember, there, there is only there is only one damning sin because we live in a day and age where we're where we point the finger. Well, that's that's horrible. You know, that's. Being a, you know, uh, you know, drinking and drugs, you're, you're, you're a drug addict, you're going to go to hell. Or you're, you're, you're a homosexual, you're going to go to hell. That's not true. That's not true. And I'm not saying it's not a sin. It is a sin. But it's not a damning sin. There's only one damning sin, and that's to reject Jesus. That's the only sin that's going to lead you to hell. Now, if you accepted Jesus and you made him your savior... Then those other things, they're going to see they, 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 they will seem wrong. If you truly accept Jesus, you will understand that this is a sin. This is a sinful lifestyle. This is a sin of what, what I do. And so um, we have to understand that, you know, we will we, we'll either we'll either love God and submit to him. Or we will love sin and submit to sin. You can't have your cake and what was it? You can't have your candy. What's the goal? What am I trying to say? What, what was it? You can't have a cake anymore. Who made that statement? That's the most silly statement. Why? Why would you? Why would you have cake? And I, <laughs> but you know what I mean, y'all. Okay. You 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 can't say, oh, I'm gonna sin as much as I want to. But guess what? You know, Jesus loves me. There's a loophole in the Bible. If I say I'm sorry about the sin, then it's gonna be okay. It doesn't work that way. God is merciful. You sin, He's gonna He's gonna forgive you. But if you keep doing the same sin again and again and again and again and thinking it's OK, you might want to check. You might want to check your you might want to check yourself with God because that's not OK with him. But as you said, you know, we can't have our, our cake and eat it at the same time, whatever it is. We'll either, 
Well, you love, I love lemon cake, by the way. So if you ever want to make your pastor a cake, I love lemon cakes. My favorite cake. Well, oh, my favorite. I mean, no one makes lemon, lemon cake. Rosa, Rosa makes lemon cake. My mama, my mom does. My mom doesn't count because she's my mom. She knows exactly what I want. But love lemon cake. So, you know, we choose a master. All We all choose a master. OK, whether your master is pornography, whether it's gambling, whether it's drinking, whether it's drugging, whether it's, you know, flesh. Or whether it's Jesus. That's the master that you want to choose. Be a slave to God. <laughs> Being a slave to God is not too bad. A slave to love, a slave to peace, a slave to understanding, a slave to forever, forever joy, a slave to a father who loves you with all his 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 heart, his physical heart, too, as Jesus. The blinding of the Jews and the destruction of Jerusalem was because they refused to recognize their visitation. After Jesus was presenting himself as king, he wept over the city and he made it clear that peace was God's, God's intention, y'all. Jesus wept over the city and, and said, the truth was hidden uh, from your eyes because they rejected what God provided for their, priest, their, for their peace. First, Jesus wept over the coming judgment. Even though God knew he would, he would be rejected, God did not intend for the Jews to reject him, okay? He did not intend that. And it is certain that he did not force it to happen. The Bible makes it clear that the Messiah's visitation was intended for their peace. The Bible also tells us when God's people were blinded, um, now they were hidden. They are hidden from your eyes. It was after rejection that Israel was blinded, not before. We are clearly told the reason for God's judgment. It was because they did not know. It was because they did not know the time he visited them. The entire Old Testament points to his coming. <laughs> They said it was the time they didn't know. They didn't say they didn't know the time he visited. No, the entire Old Testament points to him coming. It's fanfare. I'm coming, dude. <laughs> here I come. I'll be here. And with prophecy, it said to the T. That's what that's crazy. It said to the T, like exactly how he would come in, exactly what he'd be riding on in exact fashion. He'd be coming. And they still did not get it. But you know what? Y'all, I, I, I love Israel. OK, I do. I love Israel because God loves Israel. We should love Israel. You know, it made me so sad. It made me so sad. And so uh, it's funny. I, I was taught I, I, with my with, with my young adults here. Young. I'm, I'm not calling them adults yet. They're teens, but they, they, they are very mature. But uh, we we're sitting here talking about voiceovers and the voiceovers whenever, you know, you're, you have video playing and you got, you know, you're doing the voiceover voice kind of over it, kind of behind it. But you don't see my face. But I did a voiceover for Israel, and, I, and it was a short video. And I tried to make it as I made the video on, on our church TikTok, and I made the video as 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 um, PC as possible, I guess. You know, love Israel. What Scripture says? It says we're commanded to love Israel. And you know, it's amazing how much people love Israel. I was so happy to see all the people that loved Israel. But then at the same time, I wasn't surprised to see all the negative con comments. On there, I, I was I, I was certain that was going to happen, but what made me the most sad is how much or how many young people on there commenting about Israel, commenting negative thoughts about Israel, and that's why we have a lot of young people out there. Not in this church though, but a lot of young people that 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 that, that they they don't even. It would be different if they knew why they were they were pro Palestine. And, but they don't. They are told a lie. They're told to to hate Israel. Why? Because, well, maybe because the conservative church is telling you to because the Bible's telling you because God's telling you to. Loving Israel does not again does not mean that we want people to die in Palestine. But we're looking here. And I'm, I'm going to be controversial real quick when I close it. Close, close the sermon. Lord, help me uh, that I say the right things. Um. War is hell, no matter what way you cut it. War is absolute hell. 
The innocent die during war. Most of the time, it is the innocent. You know, when we invaded, when we, when we invaded both times, when we invaded Iraq, men, men, women, and children died. It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. But when we support Israel, we support the stabilization and keeping a sovereign God anointed nation all the support we can and keep it alive. It's not going anywhere, by the way. They don't they don't need us, by the way. They got God. But you have one 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 group of evil. I think it's pure evil. Who wants to destroy every single Jewish person, man, women and child, wipe them off the face of the earth. Then, yes, I think that evil needs to be needs to, need to be dealt with. And it will be dealt with. But in the grand scheme of things, as Christians, no, it's horrible. I don't care what what religion or, or, or what ethnicity or what how their parents are or who they are. When a kid dies, it's horrible. OK. But. If they're allowing sin, if they're allowing evil to fester in their nation, God will deal with it just like us. <laughs> just like the United States. If we allow evil to prevail or if we allow it in our lives, we allow it in our in our household, we allow the sin to come in. We we, we say we're OK. It's OK to, to be a sexual pervert. It's OK to, to change the identity of a, of, of a male to a female. We say stuff like this is OK. Then guess what? We're going to reap the consequences of the sin. We will reap what we sow. The Bible tells us so. Just like the kids song goes, it tells us so. So we need to stand up and be firm as parents, as grandparents, and in some cases as great grandparents. <laughs> Look at a sister Kay. I know she's not the only great grandparent over here, but we have several great grandparents. OK, we need a Samson. So the same is true for all of us who reject God's plan in our life. OK, we talk about the, 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 the day's message and how Israel rejected God. All the Jewish people did. The same is true for all of us who rejects God's plan in our life. God may indeed foretell the consequences of sin, but God, you know, or, you know, foretell the consequences for sin. But God's intention is for our good. Just because God can see the end from the beginning and knows what choice we'll make does not mean that God has intended for us to make sinful choices. He does not intend for you to make sinful choices. God knew Israel would fail, and as soon as it's, we'll soon see, God has also already foretold how he will show them grace again. This is true in the individual's life as well. God foreknew the path that Brother Kevin would take, that my mom would take, that uh, the whole bishop family would take, that everybody in here would take. He knew the sinful choices. You know, we, you know the, the sinful choices do have severe consequences, but God allows our sins to judge us, but also he shows us grace and has a plan for our redemption. Sometimes those sins, a lot of times that they do, I hope they hurt. I hope they have consequences. But those consequences show us the better side, the brighter side. I tell you all what, I face consequences for my sins. I'm not perfect today. One day in glory, I might be perfected, but not, not here on earth. I won't be. But I tell you what, I would not want to live through some of the sins that I lived through. Not again. But if I didn't have those sins, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have known the difference. But I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is I don't want you. <laughs> I don't want I don't want especially my young folks. I don't want my young folks to go out there and live it because it doesn't have to be that way. If I had it my choice, I, I wouldn't I would I would want to do it over again. I want to go right. I want to do do right as, as as early as I could. I want to be a pastor at 18, like Charles Charles Fake was. <laughs> Didn't want to wait for I wait till I was uh, 30, 33. I think when I first started preaching, I'm 41 now. Uh, I didn't want to wait that long, you know. But that was part of God's plan. I'm not saying it, it wasn't because it was all part of God's plan, you know. Regardless of how badly we have blown it, though, okay. I want y'all to get this, all right. And I'm going to close this. I promise I'm laying the plane. This is one of my longer sermons. So you know, I hope my wife's home time at me. But and Matthew said I can go as long as I want today. So it's Matthew's fault. 
Um, cow- what, the Cowboys aren't playing right now or what? <laughs> All right, now lean it close to this church. Let's get serious here for a second. So regardless of how badly we have blown it with God, or we think we've blown it with God, God's grace remains unmerited for all. When we repent, he welcomes us home with loving arms. Okay? It's not too late. It's never too late. You are his child. He loves you so much. When we repent, he welcomes you home with loving arms. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the word today. I thank you for for I thank you for this this the uh, I guess the honest this reality of just 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 knowing this is real. You know what just knowing that everything that you say is real. It's the most I don't know if realist is the word, but it's the most realist thing ever. I uh, thank you, Jesus. I uh, thank you for this. I pray that you anoint each and every one of us to just 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 fulfill our calling in Jesus' name. Amen. So I, don't, I dare not end a sermon without offering a lifeline. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, please make a profession of faith today because tomorrow is not promised. Only death is, okay? I can't promise you'll be here tomorrow. I can't. I know when I and I'm 41, I still feel like I'm 21. <laughs> uh, but I know when I was I know when I was 21, I, like I said I'm still the same way. I feel like man, I could run forever. I could I could hit the punching bag forever. I could you know run 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 around the country forever. But you know. Hey, you never know. You can walk outside and asteroid can fall over your head. You never know. You know, I mean, we've got tomorrow's not promised. So make a profession of faith today. Give your life to Jesus Christ. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you're committing to him. OK, it's not just saying, Jesus, hey, I love you and I want you to be my savior. It is that, too. But it's saying I want to follow you. I want to be a disciple. I want to commit to you and what your word says. And I do repent for my sins. OK, so please come up. Oh, am I on oh, my next one? Sorry, my bad. Let's go over there. Where we got? We're on an invitational hymn. Dee, 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 490. <laughs> Far away from God. And my phone's going on. I'll be quiet. Yeah.